Hi there, and welcome to Research America's Alliance discussion. I'm Mary Woolley, Research America's CEO and President, your moderator today. For the past several weeks, we've hosted Alliance discussions with uh, featuring our 2024 Advocacy Awards honorees. And I'm looking forward to another one of those conversations today. But first, let me thank you for joining us and for your partnership in the Research America Alliance. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Celine Gounder. You may know that uh, Dr. Gounder is going to be receiving the 2024 Meeting the Moment in Public Health Award from Research America. Congratulations, Dr. Gounder. Thank you, Mary. As you may know, Dr. Gounder is an internationally renowned internist, infectious disease specialist, and epidemiologist. She is also a CBS News medical contributor and senior fellow and editor at large for public health at KFF and KFF Health News. So you can tell she's pretty busy mm -hmm. as one of the world's leading experts in science, medicine, and public health communication. Before we get started, I'll quickly remind our audience to please type your questions into the Q&A box or chat, and we'll pose as many as we can during the Q&A portion of today's discussion. So hello again, and thank you for joining us, Dr. Gounder, Celine. Um, I want to start out today um, to ask you to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? How did you get interested in medicine and public health and then journalism? And how did you put those together in your career? Talk to us. Sure. Um, I am the child of two immigrants. Uh, my father was from Southern India, uh, came to the US for his studies, uh, was really on scholarship throughout uh, his education. My mom's oldest brother was a classmate of his and she wanted to improve her English, so spent summers in the US uh, with her brother. And that's how she met my dad. It was, uh, my dad was at Northwestern, so it was a Chicago area, 1968, you know, a pretty heady time uh, in our nation's history. And there's no question that certainly had a huge impact on my dad and his ideals uh, at the time. Um, I was really good at math and science growing up. My, it was something my dad also really pushed and encouraged. Um, and wanted to find a way to um, leverage math and science in public service and came around to that uh, in college, uh, really was influenced by two classes I took in college, one in medical anthropology, where we read, of course, the work of Dr. Paul Farmer, among others, somebody who would later become one of my mentors, and a course in um, health and human rights. And coming out of that, and then um, research I did for my senior thesis in college on public health and disease eradication was pretty, uh, had pretty much solidified my commitment to that as a career path. Um, growing up, you also asked, where did I grow up? Um, really uh, both coasts, you might say, I don't have a hometown. My dad was uh, largely a Boeing aerospace lifer, so worked on a number of uh, government contracts with NASA, the defense industry, and so on. But it meant moving every three to four years or so. Um, so of course we were in Seattle, which is where Boeing is headquartered, but also everywhere from Connecticut down to Southern Virginia on the East Coast. Uh, and I do think having to move that much had a big impact on um, just how I approach things today, socially, and uh, what I look for in, um, in community. Well, that is uh, quite a story, among other things. We're, we're gonna have to find a time to talk about Chicago in 1968. That's my hometown, and boy, was I there and part of that. Um, but the way you've moved around and worked with communities is where I wanna go next, um, because you do have a, a um, a wonderful um, and I know well-deserved reputation for working effectively with communities. And that can't always be easy. I wonder if you could talk to us about not only the importance you attach to working with communities, but how you go about it. What is that experience all about when it comes to medical health and public health? Yeah, I think where I really learned about that was in um, the earlier part of my career working in global health in Southern Africa, uh, much of that was uh, spent in South Africa, but also in a number of other countries. 
And I found myself getting pulled in to um, help with a lot of community activities, whether it might be a town hall or working with local journalists or patient organizations. Uh, and this was also a time when uh, there was an understanding that if you're gonna be doing research of any kind um, in these kinds of communities, uh, that you really need to have their involvement and they need to be empowered uh, to engage and weigh in. And um, there was already a culture of uh, community advisory boards in the kind of research that I was engaging in. And so really learned about um, the importance of that through that experience. Uh, also got mentored by folks like Peter Staley and Mark Harrington, who of course were very important HIV activists in the early days of the uh, epidemic here in the United States. And you know that's a, much of what they also uh, teach is the importance of uh, activists and, and how um, they really do have uh, value in guiding uh, science and how we do science. Um, more recently, and this is really coming out of the 2016 election, I had sort of this hybrid response where I think a lot of, um, you know, by this point I was um, already engaged in journalism, not just medicine and public health. And a lot of journalists at the time were asking themselves, how did we miss how popular um, tr uh, Trump was going to be in many parts of the country? And uh, there was this notion of that uh, that they had been neglecting quote unquote flyover states, that they had overly focused their reporting from coastal uh, big cities. And what I came away uh, from the 2016 election was that I had done something similar, frankly, with medicine and public health. I knew Southern Africa better than I knew the Midwest or the, the South in the United States. And so um, decided I was going to focus in on some of the um, areas that had the worst health outcomes in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, around the same time, Chris Murray at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, that, that group started to release these papers in JAMA and elsewhere with these maps of burden of disease, um, starting with just excess mortality. And what I took away from that was is really a story. Every map is a story of disease in this country. And as I drilled down further and further, um, picked out a few places I wanted to work. I went first to West Virginia, uh, to Kanawha County, which uh, at least at the time had the highest rate of opioid overdose in the country, because I just wanted to see on the ground what the issues were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, decided to go to Indian reservations. And um, you know, in terms of engaging with communities in, um, in uh, tribal communities, just one example uh, of a story, is around uranium mining, which continues to impact the health of um, Navajo and other indigenous groups in the Southwest, and spent some time with the folks on uh, Red River, uh, Red Water Pond Road, um, that community, which has been very active in advocating. And they have a yearly commemoration and just spent the day with the folks from the community. They do a march around the area where they showed us where the uranium mining had occurred and how it had damaged the environment and really just spending time listening. Um, I think that's perhaps some of the most important work that needs to be done. I, lo I love all of this history and you know your, your experiences on the ground and how it's influenced you. And I hear those themes about telling stories that I associate with the very best journalism and listening. And uh, the journalists are so skilled at that. Now, these are skill sets that the um, science trained community, including the public health community, don't necessarily receive as part of their training, um, even though uh, public health, by definition, you know, sort of by remit, uh, has to engage with the public. Do you have any suggestions about how the public health community can do better in that community engagement? Well, I think first listening and secondly, show that you care. Um, I think those are probably the two most important things. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that might mean having more town halls, more engagement. Uh, one of the things I also learned working um, in Southern Africa is the importance of if you're going to have a town hall meeting or something like that. You need to provide food. You need to provide transportation uh, so that it's easy for people to engage and attend and take part. Um, so those would be some of the simple things. I, I think part of what's really challenging in storytelling is that people want to hear stories usually of individuals 
uh, individuals who are facing a challenge and how they are overcoming that challenge. And public health is a story of communities, not individuals. And so yeah, it can be yeah. challenging, right, to tell that story in a way that will resonate um, with another individual. So how can we make these stories of public health as personal as possible? And that means sometimes you as a public health worker may need to be part of the story. That's, and that I think is very challenging in general for science trained individuals who are more likely to stay back, to hold mm -hmm. back and not engage in their personal story. Um, it's one of the reasons I, you know, I'd like to start out in these conversations with some personal information to try to get us all comfortable with the fact that we're we're all in this together. We're we're um, people like everybody else. So thank you for making that wonderful point. So part of the problem with communicating about public health these days, especially I'm thinking about during the pandemic, but actually I think it's always been true, is that it seems to me, and I'd love your view on this, that it's always had a challenge around being political. And today we use this term politicized, you know, politicization, but it because there's a um, public remit to public health by, you know, it's word, its name says that, that sometimes it's, it involves policies and laws too, mm -hmm. to enact real and meaningful change, like famously smoking, um, seat belts, actually the list goes on. You could include um, fencing swimming pools to keep people healthy. So what has, What's gone off the rails in your judgment um, in more recent days as we've been communicating about COVID and preventing um, its spread and keeping us all healthy and related issues? Well, public health is about uh, collective responsibility and collective action. Mm -hmm. It's yes. also about the allocation of scarce resources. So really, when you're talking about individual versus collective and you're talking about scarce resources, that's by definition political. So I don't think you can really escape that. Um, I think another question to ask is, should public health workers be activists? And there has been debate about this. I think mm -hmm. that really depends. Are you working for the government? as a public health worker or expert, or are you say working for a community-based organization or in academia? And so I think the roles of people in public health, depending on your institution is going to differ. Um, I do think government workers need to be transparent about their values and should refrain as much as possible on imposing their values on others. We can lay out what are strategies, what are approaches for tackling different problems. Uh, we can talk through the policy trade-offs and what is the best data available um, to support different policies. Um, you know, what are the health trade-offs, the economic trade-offs, the, the social trade-offs. I think one of the reasons you've seen the rise of this anti-science movement is the perception that science leads to regulation. And in fact, it does, right? Um, in public health, we understand the importance of evidence-based policies, but we also have to acknowledge that people's opinions are not just based on scientific evidence. They're also based on these economic considerations, especially short-term economic uh, mm -hmm. considerations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these opinions are also being formed by what is acceptable or the norm in, in a community. Right, and that gets back to this theme about knowing communities, mm -hmm. you know, being listening to communities so that uh, so that you and, and your colleagues and others in public health uh, understand what some of the trade-offs truly are. Um, we can't escape that reality. And we could all hope for the trade-offs are always going to argue in favor of better health for the most people all the time. But it's tricky, as you point out, especially in the short term, even versus the wrong, longer term. Um, Thank you for bringing in trust too. I think that's on everyone's mind right now with a decline in trust of all institutions and of people with public uh, responsibilities, elected officials very much included. Um, and yet people do share a commitment to wanting uh, better health for themselves and their families. You know, and and uh, public health plays a big role that in that you you have a podcast I'm to, I'm told um, called Epidemic and you were exploring the eradication of smallpox 
What can you tell us that you learned from that or that we can, might be able to apply now or in general on public health challenges? I think one is this notion of moral imagination, which is wow. how do you judge the uh, morality or ethics of different uh, policies that you might implement? And is that, um, should we be measuring that against what's obvious? Uh, or should we be measuring that against uh, what's possible if we uh, dare to imagine bigger? Uh, and I would argue that we should really push ourselves to imagine bigger and not just look at what are the options in front of our noses, uh, sometimes uh, quite literally in the case, for example, of masking and, and COVID. Um, you know, we've been very <laughs> focused on these specific tools for controlling COVID. So vaccinations, masking, um, testing, treatment, and the discussion doesn't really go further than that. And there are so many other tools that we could be employing here, whether it's improving indoor air ventilation, which would actually build resilience, uh, public health resilience uh, for many of the other threats we have coming, whether that's wildfire related smoke or, uh, you know, the next pandemic. Um, that's just one example. Are we talking about uh, paid sick and family medical leave to make it possible for people to stay home when they're sick or when they're stay home with their child when their child is sick. Uh, you know, when you're asking people to do these pro-social, pro-public health things, and it's gonna cost them a day's wages or for uh, extra childcare or whatever it is, it's really a, a very big ask. Um, so I would say just having the imagination to, to dream bigger. I love that. I love that phrase, the imagination to dream bigger. And what can what kind of advice would you give the folks that have joined us today or all of the Research America advocacy world, shall we say, about being more effective as advocates? How can we put that um, advice to dream bigger, that moral imagination? I love the term to work. Yeah, I mean, I think that starts with ourselves thinking bigger, right? Um, you know, what are you advocating for? Uh, are you advocating for the obvious things or are you advocating for something bigger? And I think um, setting the bar much higher is where this needs to start. You know, one of the lessons or one of the things um, Dr. Bill Fagey told me, so he was uh, one of the leaders of smallpox eradication, was the director of the CDC under President Jimmy Carter, and is just one of the um, eminence gris of the public health field. And he said to me, people require evidence of sustainability before they'll fund something, but you don't know what's sustainable until you try and do it. And I think that's so important to remember is to try and do some of these things and experiment, even if it's at a smaller community level, but to demonstrate what works and then to try to use that as leverage to push for expansion of, of what works. Why well, that's, are you running for office? Can we vote? <laughs> <laughs> I surely would. Um, well, you, you've mentioned a, a, a few things that we might see coming down the road. Interesting, you know, like smoke issues, which we saw over the course of the last year with the Canadian wildfires um, and their uh, the reach that they had. And then, of course, the terrible tragedy in Maui. Um, but what what else do you see and what are you talking with your peers and and um whomever, uh, that's coming down the road at us in 2024, 2025 that are in the in the domain of public health? Well, I think um, the intersection of climate change and public health uh, is going to be really important in the years of, ahead, uh, whether that's in terms of air quality, water quality, uh, emerging infectious diseases. So we are mm -hmm. going to see the expansion of tick habitats, uh, mosquito habitats, um, are we going to be prepared for that? And that's partly a question of surveillance. It's partly a question of um, our healthcare system, which uh, unfortunately is coming out of the COVID pandemic really pretty battered. It's a question of being able to communicate with the public. And I think related to that is also this um, parallel um, disinformation um, epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is really fueling many of the challenges we're seeing in public health. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, um, that, that's a big one, of course, the disinformation epidemic, and I've forgotten who coined that term, but I do think that's relevant. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for, for us, for Research America or individuals in that regard about how to do our part? 
I think um, we think about disinformation in a very siloed way. So we think about it for vaccines or you know public health issues. We think about it for healthcare. We think about it for national security or elections. And we're not thinking about it in a more holistic coordinated way because if you look at who's actually producing that disinformation, who's funding it, what their motivations are, it really does come down to a certain um, uh, lowest common denominator. And uh, attacking it in a cross silo, cross industry, cross sector way, I think is what it's really gonna take to get a handle on this. And we're just not thinking about it in those terms right now. Boy, that's uh, wise wise words. Um, I know there is, because we're involved in it, um, a coalition for trust in health and science that is trying to uh, do more in that space uh, by putting all the best minds and the best work together, learning from each other instead of one, you know, each of us trying to do individual efforts as important as they are. Um, well, uh, Time is flying here, and I suspect that we have some questions from those who are, are listening. So I'm going to ask Jacqueline to join us on, on screen here. And Jacqueline, do we have questions for Dr. Gounder? Yes, thank you, Mary, and thanks, Dr. Gounder. This discussion has been excellent so far. So for our first audience question, uh, going back to what we were discussing about uh, science communication and the public, uh, given the complexity and nuance of health and medical information, the reality that fake news has faster legs than real news and people's tendency to research info on the web, uh, what advice would you give for researchers about communicating with the public? Um, I think, one, making yourself available. So a lot of the work I did during the pandemic was not, I mean, you probably, many of you may have seen me on television or in other um, media outlets, but a lot of the work I did was actually with local community groups too and making yourself available. And sometimes it's just listening and letting people vent and showing that you care enough to spend the time um, because that's actually what convinces people. You don't have to spend a lot of time providing facts. It's showing that you care and that you can be trusted. And then honestly, your, your message that you're delivering can be really uh, short and to the point. And then you know, again, make your, yourself available for questions about that. Um, but I think that's how I would reframe the way people engage in communication. And communication is not necessarily mass media either. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the way I frame it is force equals mass times acceleration. We all have a certain amount of force. Mass, think of that, that as the size of your audience. You're just going to have a lot more acceleration with a smaller audience than a big audience, especially if you're from that community. And not to view that as less prestigious and less worth your time. I think academics in particular like to publish in the most prestigious journal. Uh, it's not the same thing with science communication. It's not necessarily the most prestigious outlet that's going to have the biggest impact. Great. Thank you. What was that um, uh, formula again? Mass, say it again. You were sounding force. like Einstein there. <laughs> <laughs> it's physics 101. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. We, you know, we all have about the same okay. amount of you know, force, but it's like, what is the mass you're taking on? And, and you know, that's going to predict how much acceleration you're going to have on that issue or with that, or with that audience. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> I know we could bring physics in somehow. <laughs> Sorry, Jacqueline, go for it. Sure. So our next question, is there a role for AI in educating the public about health or specifically in, in uh, countering misinformation? Uh, great question. I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing already is uh, AI being used to create disinformation and propagate disinformation. Uh, there are um, companies work looking at solutions um, to curb disinformation, I'll just give you one example of a company called Clarity.ai. They're based out of Israel, where they are working to identify uh, photos, videos coming out of, for example, Gaza, um, to identify what is real, what's a deep fake. I do think we need countermeasures like that. Um, and that's going to be important in, in science and medicine as well. We've seen a number of images in various scientific publications that were falsified or altered. Uh, changing the scientific results, and that has created scandals at various different institutions. Um, and so I think there's a need for that in science as well. 
Um, could we be using generative AI to, for example, create uh, different forms of media uh, really at a maybe a more accessible level for the public where here you feed in your scientific publication and then it feeds out maybe um, a TikTok video and a um, Instagram image with a message mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of things um, we haven't really pursued yet, but I think there is something to be said for um, trying to figure out how to use AI in that way. Wow, Great. thank you. That, yeah, very interesting, because I know it takes yeah. time to make those reels. So if you just input and it does the work for you, that's great for scientists. Um, so next question, uh, you have an amazing background, Celine, in both journalism, medicine, and public health. What kind of barriers have you encountered in working to get your messages out to the largest and most important audiences? Um, I think one challenge is you have different codes of ethics and professional duties in each and to whom is your responsibility. And they're not the same. In patient care, your responsibility, your duty is to the patient in front of you. In public health, it's to the community. Uh, in media, it's to your audience. And so those can sometimes come into conflict mm -hmm. and it's something I still um, sometimes struggle with. Uh, in my mind, I think of it in terms of my commitment is to public health first. Uh, if I'm doing clinical work, absolutely to the patient and to um, you know, to, uh, to the journalistic norms um, third. And so that means sometimes I may not be as aggressive with certain things because I do think it might cause somebody harm or cause a community mm -hmm. harm. Um, and you know, that's just how I balance that. You know, that is uh, true. I'm gonna jump in there. That is really a, a thoughtful um, dissection, if you will, of the different audiences. I, could you add, elected officials, elected and appointed mm -hmm. officials to that and how you think about and might advise others to yeah. think of responsibility? Well, there's, yeah, there's certainly a different audience. And I would say elected officials are accountable to us. So yeah. I don't have a responsibility mm -hmm. to an elected official unless I've been tapped as an advisor, which of course I have been in the past. Um, but I, I think, you know, in my current role, they're accountable to us. And so it's really... Yeah. Um, how do you hold them accountable to what they we think they should be doing or to what they um, say they're going to do? Beautifully said. You can come work for us anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jacqueline, did you have any more? Oh, yes, yeah, I believe we have time for one more and then I'll turn it back to you, Mary. Uh, so Celine, we've had several questions um, on climate change. How mm -hmm. do you gauge uh, public acceptance of climate change as a true threat. Are we getting there? I think you have to make it as concrete as possible. Um, there are some places you just can't avoid um, what's happening in front of you. You know, if you go down to Miami, where you have climate gentrification, where people are, uh, you have developers that are buying up land that was historically um, owned and, and inhabited by communities of color. Um, that's now being redeveloped for wealthy or communities who are moving away uh, from the water's edge. Um, you know, it's clearly happening there. Um, you know, what's happening with uh, dengue or chikungunya in, in certain years. Uh, you know, I, I think really making it concrete of what is in somebody's backyard and connecting that to climate change. It's not, you know, we like to talk about the polar bears. It's not the stories of the polar bears or what's happening in Greenland that's that's gonna resonate. And it's it's really those, um, I think health is, is one of the best angles uh, to, to make this really personal. Well, I, we, we agree. So, you know, the I think the um, health story around climate change is kind of late in becoming uh, pr as prominent as it deserves to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, that at least makes me feel that things could be moving in a better direction. <laughs> We got a long way to go, though, right? <laughs> right. Um, the work of of public health is uh, enormous, enormous. So, we um, are out of time. Can you believe you know time flies here? But I so appreciate your taking the time to talk with us, Celine, Dr. Gounder, and we congratulate you again on uh, the award that we'll be very proud to present um, on March 13th. Please, please, uh, those in the audience who haven't already uh, decided to join us on March 13th, um, 
please consider doing so. I want to make one quick announcement before we do end um, today's gathering. Please join us for our next Alliance discussion. That'll be this Thursday at one o'clock Eastern time, uh, when we'll be hosting an important conversation with another of Research America's awardees this year, and that's the Alzheimer's Association. We all know what um, an enormous um, and, re and still unsolved challenge uh, the Alzheimer's um, epidemic, we can say, uh, truly is. So we'll be joined by the president of the Alzheimer's Association, Dr. Joanne Pike, and um, her colleague, Colleague, Ms. Myra Garcia, who's been serving on the association's early stage advisory group. And they're going to be talking about this challenge and what it takes to be an effective advocate on behalf truly of us all. So to register, um, please take a look at the link in the chat and think about being with us two days, uh, just two days from now. We look forward to seeing you again soon and to seeing you soon, Dr. Gounder. Keep doing great things. Thanks, Mary. Bye-bye. <laughs>